can't do that. So we can get on with the show. Um, and thank you all for showing up. And if you had any questions, like I said, about IGDA, what we do in the LA Games community, feel free to talk to us afterwards. We would love to have you all come on board and come to our other events and take advantage of our discounts on events like GDC and uh, help us at last and all of the things we do, textbooks and whatnot. So yeah, look forward to this event. Thank you so much to our speakers from the sky. Tonight, you're all engineers. Uh, or at least you're going to become engineers as we pump you full of engineering knowledge. Um, it's going to be exciting. If you have a laptop here, feel free to take it out and follow along. We're going to be doing some live coding, and you guys can code it too. And then at the end, you'll have your whole own personal back end system set up if you're into that. Uh, I think, well, we've never run through this presentation before, but it's probably going to be like two hours. Maybe it'll be 45 minutes. Maybe it'll be like seven hours. <laughs> be good. It'll be like extended version of the two towers or something. But I think I think it's gonna go pretty well. So, so let's get started. Backend development, powerful, simple, free, using Unity and Node.js. Make a modern multiplayer mobile masterpiece. Now, there's a little disclaimer here. I'm not claiming that we've actually done that. Uh, we've definitely made a modern multiplayer mobile game. We think it's a masterpiece. It's tons of fun, but it's up to the public to judge that. So I'm Josh, this is Charles, Hi. and we're from Naked Sky Entertainment, and uh, I'm going to run you guys through what we're going to be doing tonight. So you're probably asking yourself, what's going on? Well first, we'll tell you a little bit more about who we are, and then we're going to teach you how to make a dynamic web server in five minutes. So the teaching will take longer than five minutes, but by the time you ingested all the knowledge, you'll be able to make your own web server in five minutes. It'll be awesome. We're going to learn Node.js, NPM, Express, and we're going to do all of those verbs. Uh, awesome is not a verb, but it should be. <laughs> OK, so then we're going to learn about persisting that data, right? So you have your web server. How are you actually going to keep the data around that your web server collects, um, store like your user's health and their, their money that they have, and how many potions they have, and their health and stuff. So we're going to learn about JSON and MongoDB. Then we're going to actually, all, up until this point, we're going to do demos using the browser and Node.js. Then we're actually going to talk about how do you get Unity to talk to your backend server. How does that connection work? So we're going to learn about REST and this cool open source software, Simple JSON. And we're going to write some code to actually say hello to the server. And then we're going to actually make it a game. So we're going to teach you how to like set up your account, um, how to do a fight, and how to use potions. So you may wonder, well, I've written a game before in Unity. Uh, I was able to make fighting and potion drinking not use a backend server. Why, why do I need to bother with a backend server? Well, backend server provides persistence of data for you, right? So your players can switch between devices. It provides protection against cheating. So you make critical decisions on your server. And then people hacking your client can't mess with that too much. I mean, there, there are ways, but they can't do too much. Your server gets to do that logic. And also, I don't know if any of you have submitted an app to the iOS App Store. But it's like at least nine painful days of waiting until it actually comes out. So if you need to fix a bug and it's in your client code, you're like, ah, oh, it's going to be nine days until that's fixed, or seven if you're lucky. But if your logic is on the back end, right, in Node.js on your own server, then you're like, oh, I fixed the bug, <coughs> done. And then it's right away. Uh, so that's, that's really good. So one of the things we go by is trying to keep as much logic on the back end as we can so we can fix those bugs right away. And then. We're going to talk about doing it live, how to actually get all this code up on the internet for free so you can actually launch your game and have a backend server running, and it will cost you nothing other than your own blood, sweat, and tears, and pain making everything work. But we're going to try to reduce the amount of pain tonight by uh, showing you how we do it. So first off, who are we, and why should you listen to us babble for two hours? Um, so we are Naked Sky Entertainment. We've been around since 2002. We've made a whole bunch of games you've probably never heard of. Because uh, we're an indie development studio, and not, not everybody always hears about your games. Uh, 
Right. Max Ax is probably our biggest game. I don't know. Anybody heard of that one? Okay. Well, hey, two people. Awesome. So <laughs> that was uh, these two are our mobile titles. We started out as a PC and console developer a long, long time ago, back when people made PC and console games. Yeah, it's true. There, there are some. Uh, that, that might even be us sometime in the future. But around 2013, we decided to switch to, to mobile because that was an exciting space. So we made Max X and then Scrap Force. Um, when not, we're not working on our own titles. It's also important to make payroll for your team. We're about 12 people, and everybody needs to get paid every month. Well, roughly. <laughs> Approximately every month. So we've also worked with all these publishers. Um, I think half of which are out of business now. Not, not really our fault, but um, I guess a word of warning to any future publishers. If you work with us, there's a 50% chance you're going to go out of business. So, um, so Scrap Force, what is that? Well. We like to think of it as Hearthstone plus Pokemon plus awesome. Um, not that those aren't awesome, but we added in some extra awesome. It's a turn-based, tactical, collectible hero RPG, which is kind of like a mouthful. You're like, what the heck is that? We'll show you the little trailer so you can get an idea if you haven't played it. I'm assuming, assuming many of you haven't played it yet, but you will. In our game, you can collect over 300 3D heroes and items, which are very exciting. And we have over 130 missions. And given that we're a studio of about 10 people, that means we're over budget and over scope. Oh, but uh, yeah. you guys reap the benefit from that. So, so we work we work 18 hours a day so that you guys can enjoy our day. So now I'm going to try to show you this trailer. So you have some idea what we're talking about. Let's see if this works. Yeah. <laughs> you how to make your own dynamic web server in only five minutes using Node.js, NPM, and Express. So what are those things? Perhaps you've never heard of them. Perhaps you've heard them. Um, perhaps you've read a little bit about them on like Hacker News, uh, but never used them. I'll run through them a little bit before I try to show you how they all work together. So Node.js is an open source JavaScript platform. You code your backend server in JavaScript. To any of you who have been coding a long time, that might sound like insanity to you because JavaScript is like dynamically typed and there's no way to find your compile errors at a compile time or your type errors, right? They all happen while you're running your server. And you're like, ah, oh, this is madness. How do I refactor things? Well, it turns out none of that matters these days because everyone's like, I can write code really fast. I don't care if it breaks. If it, if it breaks, I'll just fix it. <laughs> so we write our back in the JavaScript. It uses Google's V8 engine. So this is the same engine that's running in Chrome. So it's really cool because it's tested by millions and millions of people every day. And Google is constantly making it faster and better. It's ES6 compliant now. So if anybody's a JavaScript fan, that's the new JavaScript hotness. Um, it's got cool things like uh, fat arrow functions and the spread operator and all the things you're excited about, except things that are in ES7 that are coming next year. It is a single-threaded asynchronous processing model, which is kind of a mouthful. What does that mean? So it means that it is event-driven. So just like a game that has frames, Node.js basically has frames. Um, you don't actually see anything render, but it ticks. So you can do things just like you can in a browser, like call set interval. If you want a JavaScript function to run every 10 seconds, 
Or if you want a JavaScript function to run like a minute later, you can call set timeout. And then your JavaScript uh, gets ticked every frame in Node.js, and then eventually, whenever later, your functions can actually get called. So this allows you to use it as a non-preemptive multitasking environment. So if you've done any multi-threading, then you know your threads can all run at the same time, and sometimes they interrupt each other and you have to worry about race conditions, and you like you write code and it works great at your workstation, and then you check it in, and then your boss demos it, and then it breaks. And he's like, oh, I broke, and you're like, well, it worked fine when I ran it. And it's like, race condition, foo! That doesn't happen in Node.js as much, because your asynchronous processes, they, they don't interrupt each other. It's non-preemptive, so when you make a call to a, say a web server, you're like, hey, I need some data from my web server, from your own web server, then Node.js can go on and do some other code while it's waiting for that response, but when the response comes back, it won't interrupt, it'll politely wait until whatever's happening is done, and then the next frame ticks, and then it processes the result. So like when you're loading something from disk, it'll go to load from the disk, and then it can run whatever code is pending in the meantime, and then when the disk access is done, and you get the data back, then it can follow up and finish this disk request. Same thing, net request when you're sending things to a database, etc. It's all callback driven. The code ends up looking a little messy. Um, I don't have enough time now to, to show you all of the crazy ways that you handle this. But what you should know about it is that you don't have to worry about race conditions as much as you do when you're programming in a preemptive multi-threading environment. So that's a reason people really, really like it. So this, Node.js.org, is where you grab it. It's free, open source. If you're curious, you can check out the code. Um, you can improve the code if you want. Uh, and you can download it and install it on your computer. So I don't know if we're going to show that later. I guess we'll show that later. Let me switch over. OK, so that's Node. And that's what's going to be hosting all of our code that we write. Next thing you need to know about is NPM. So this is the Node Package Manager. This is what makes Node really great. I mean, this is what helped Node catch on. So if you use something like Ruby, you know, it has gems that you can grab. If you've ever used Linux, you know, package managers, there's like apt-get or yum, all kinds of ways to grab different packages. This is the package manager for Node. So the way it works is some kind-hearted open source developer creates a package and saves it in a registry. And then you, as the intrepid game developer, are like, oh, I need this package. I want to be able to send push notifications or I want to be able to write cool asynchronous code with this cool construct. And you're like, I'm going to install that package. So you just have to type npm install and then the package name. And there's a little variant on this you'll probably want to know. Usually it's good form to keep all the packages that you're using in a file called package.json that's associated with your project. So you can have the package manager automatically save the names of all packages you've installed into that file if you do dash dash save. So you're going to see examples of us doing that tonight. And that's the preferred way to grab a package. <coughs> and this is how you use it in Node. So if you use, use JavaScript, you know, R, I'm going to create a variable. And this is going to represent that package. And then require, this is a, a Node keyword um, that works in Node to actually load up a package and give you access to whatever it exports. So you write it that way. And then in your file, you can use any of the functionality that that package provides. So the public registry for npm is here, npmjs.com. You can also have private registries if you want to just share node packages within your own company. But this is the one most people use for all the public stuff. When I checked it today, it had 204,000 packages. So you can kind of see the node ecosystem is very, very healthy. That's why people love it. Big reason it's so popular. I didn't expect that my bottom line would get cut off. But that really, that really made Node catch on. And that's why it's so handy. And that's why people use it, I think. OK. We got Node, we got NPM. Last thing before we get to coding is Express. So Express is a very popular <laughs> web server package for Node. I'm going to say most of the time when people are building a web server in Node, they're going to use Express. Um, not always, but it's a really popular one. How popular is it? Well. It was downloaded 148,000 times today and 3.5 million times this month. So that's pretty popular. So it supports HTTP. You can really easily set up HTTP and HTTPS, which is nice because security is really important these days. And it's got its own plugins for everything that, again, you use NPM to install. 
So it does cookies. It can sign your cookies or it can keep your cookies in an external database. It can parse JSON out of your body. Tons and tons of middleware built just for Express. Really powerful way to set up a web server. There's where you can learn more about it. We're going to put this presentation online so you guys can click the hyperlink. And the way you install it, which you already know if you remember the previous slide, all you have to do is type npm install express dash dash save. And that will install express for you for your particular project. Put it in your package JSON file, and then you're ready to use it. So now, using all that information, which Charles has never heard before, he's going to try to remember it all, uh, he's going to build live for you a web server that says hello world. Cool. Take it away. Uh, let's see if we can do that. All right. So uh, I'm on node.js.org. And if you want to follow along with me, I'm on OS X. Um, this is all pretty easy on OS X. It can also be done on Windows or Linux. Um, you'll just download 4.2. That's what I would do right here. Um, I'm not going to walk the entire install process, but only 12 megs. It's actually pretty small. No big deal. Um, once you install it, I'm just going to skip over that because I already have it installed. Um, you go to a terminal window. That's how it, the, probably the easiest way to interface with Node is. Um, so I'm in my projects folder, which is a folder I keep all my projects in terminal. I'm going to make a directory for uh, a new project here. We'll call it um, IGEDA. And then I'm going to CD into that. You guys are familiar with all the terminal. It's pretty straightforward, right? So I have this empty directory that I'm in. And now I'm actually using npm, which Josh talked about, to initialize a package JSON file for me. You can just tell it npm init. Like, don't ask me any questions. And it makes like a package JSON file for me, which is going to be useful in a bit. Um, and I'm going to do one other quick thing to get started here. We need a file. We need like something for Node to run. So the first thing we're going to do is make an index. I'm going to make it called index.js because I think that's what the default here wants it to be. So I'm just going to touch index.js. And then I'm going to open that in my text editor so that I have that file. So this is not the one I want. Yeah, I could. I actually do have that shortcut. Maybe we'll start there. Uh, so if you don't have Sublime Text, you should get it. It's all uh, all the lead coders use. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, because I don't, I don't know. That's what some of the lead coders use. I, I've met a lead coder who uses it. So, um, and Carmack uses it. It's true, he does. Um, so I'm going to make a completely new folder. I'm going to open the whole folder. So I'm going to open, and I'm going to go to that folder I made called IGDA, which hopefully is right here. It is. Got two files in it, and in Sublime you can open an entire folder if you guys aren't familiar with it as a text editor. Um, I'm gonna maximize this here for usable space. So now I've got two files: this package JSON, which NPM created for me. I'm not really gonna have to mess with that right now very much, and my index.js, which is the tiny blank file of nothingness. Um, so as Josh kind of demoed, like we can start writing code right here. Like this is I'm just gonna start with something really basic here. Console.log, blah. Um, so this is JavaScript, and like what Josh was saying with Node is like Node is going to run my JavaScript, so in my, my window here, I'll say node index.js. And like, cool, I log blah, not very useful. Um, so then I'm going to do what Josh kind of outlined to do in our presentation. I'm going to install something useful called Express. So I'm going to install Express um, dash dash save. And this will take hopefully a second. Um, and if not, it means my Wi-Fi is not working. So we'll see how this goes. And it, it took a second, so my Wi-Fi is working, which is great. Um, so now it just like basically downloaded a whole bunch of code that somebody else wrote for me and put it in a folder called node modules, which I don't ever have to look at unless something horrible goes wrong with their code. Um, so let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, and, and I lost my spline case again. One second. There we go. Um, cool. So now if we look at my package JSON, yay, I have a dependency. Yeah, Josh can point this out. It's super useful. I automatically inject this dependency on Express, which is good. And then if you look at my node modules folder, hey, there's a folder called Express there, which I'm not going to look at. Um, so then Josh kind of explained here, we go var express equals require express. Um, so what that's going to do is basically say, like, go look in that folder var express and find me, like, an object that represents the entire package, basically. Now, depending on what the package is, you're using that object can do all sorts of different things for further documentation. Um, but for express, since I've used it before, I know express actually just returns a function that all you do is you call it. Um, and it returns an app. So our express is a function, boom. And there, express gave me back an app. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then I'm going to get the next step of this. Hopefully I have it already. Got my app. I'm going to copy actually this code to start with to get you guys started. It's moving a little bit quicker. 
So here's what you can do with an app. So an app is just a representation of your web server, and web servers more or less listen to URIs, right? Like those URLs that you type in your browser, like those hit a web server and the web server gets them and does something. So in Express what you do is you say, well, when someone goes to my web server, my local host in this case, and goes to the hello endpoint, like, which means like they type in their browser, localhost, colon, whatever, report on, slash hello, like call this function and pass it like rec and res, and those are some important parts we'll have to deal with later. Uh, so in this case, I wrote my server. It's actually pretty much done. There's one last step. I think I call app.listen, and that's it. Like that's a web server in Express. I'm pretty sure. Josh, do you see anything I'm missing? In the port to listen. I think I'm in the port to listen. Yeah, I think you tell it like whatever port you want. We'll tell it 3000 or. Yeah, we'll tell 3000 for now. So this little line here, the res.sends, this is where we're sending back what we want to send back to the web server. Right. So let's actually just try this one and see if it works. Because I mean, it might not, but let's get started. So now, and when I run index.js in my node server, now you see it doesn't exit immediately and log something because now I've actually have this thing and it's running indefinitely as long as until I kill the process. So that's going to let me hopefully go to localhost, colon 3000, hello. And what do you know? Like, that's awesome. I just made a web server on my computer, and it was almost five minutes. So Josh, is there a next step? Or is anyone, do you want to do questions? Yeah, let's keep going. I'll ask you questions at the end. That's questions at the end. OK, so anyway, yeah, let's recap like, what this code does. Let me get back to it really quickly. OK, cool. So all this code does is it says, you got this Express app running. Listen for hello. When someone goes to hello, that's the, like, the suffix of that URL. And call this function. And in here, I just make a little JavaScript object. Um, if you guys are familiar with JavaScript at all, this is just the standard object syntax. Like, it is an object with a property called hello. And that property is set to the word world. And then I just send that whole object back. And like Express kind of takes care of all of the middle work for you. It takes that object that's in your programming language it transforms it into JSON, and then it sends it back as text as a response to that HTTP request, and then you see it in the browser. So that's that's really simple, but like that's kind of the building block of everything when you're going to be talking to the server. Great. Oh, you press laptop. Okay, so now you all know how to make your own web server. Now we're going to do something with it. We want to figure out how we can persist the data. So when people send us these requests like hello world or kill a monster, we want to be able to save that somewhere so that when they come back in a later session, we know exactly what went on. So will there be like a free download for all this? All this. Yeah. All this is going to be on GitHub. Okay. All the code and like everything we're demoing. Yeah. Totally. Yes. Sure. OK, so how do we persist data? Well, Charles alluded to this thing called JSON before. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's a subset of the JavaScript language itself in text that represents a JavaScript object, a textual way to represent a JavaScript object. So it's just plain text, which is great because it's really easy to read as a human. It's really easy to debug because you can just look at it and know what's going on. Whereas if you've serialized your data in any other format, sometimes it's a lot of hex and you're like, what the heck's going on? Um, it's compilable JavaScript. So you can just copy it and paste it into your actual JavaScript code if you need to test something. It's just a subset of the JavaScript language itself. So if you haven't used JavaScript before, I'll tell you, just like JavaScript, every object is a hash of primitive data types. So that means in your object, you can have a property that's a string, a property that's a number, a bool, an array, or an object. So you can have a property that points to another object that has its own properties in it. There's no way to do circular references easily. But other than that, it's pretty robust in terms of representing data you need. So this guy is, is Mitch from our game. Oh, you can also map things to undefined and null. So this guy's Mitch from our game. Let's look at a simple JSON object that might represent Mitch, right? So this is actual JavaScript, but also JSON. This is how we send data around into the database, back and forth to our client. And we have a property called name that says his name is Mitch. That's a string property. Then we have a bool property. Does he like tacos? Definitely true. And then how many tacos per minute? Here's a number. You can eat two pie tacos per minute. Here are favorite <laughs> orders. And then this is an array. So this is just JavaScript notation for an array. Really simple. And then, of course, you can have an object inside it. You can see one ghost pepper is enough for anybody. <laughs> that, was, that was right after you ate the ghost pepper. Um, yeah, so this is how we represent our objects that we're going to persist. Now, what do we do with them? Where do we shove them? 
So there are a whole lot of options here. There are a ton of databases that take JavaScript or have JavaScript-like syntax um, that are popular. The one we use for Scrap Force is called MongoDB. I'm not gonna say it's better than the others. We did some quick analysis like two years ago and it had some advantages we liked, so I encourage you to explore, but we're gonna show you guys how MongoDB works. Well, what you can do with it. I have no idea how it works behind the scenes. <laughs> so, MongoDB is known as, as a NoSQL database, which is a horrible way to classify things. It just means you don't use SQL. So if anybody programmed relational databases five years ago and those were popular seven years ago, like Oracle or MySQL, um, those required this structured query language, SQL. A whole new class of databases, people are like, too lazy to structure their queries, so they're like, I want to shove any object in and not worry about it ahead of time. So that is the NoSQL. And all these different NoSQL databases are not the same. They all take different forms of data. Some take straight JSON, some take some special subset of JSON. They're only united in the fact that you don't need to use SQL. So what you can do with Mongo, you can get it running on a different computer from your server, if you want, or on the same computer. And you can store JSON objects into it. So a way that you would do that, you can call insert one, and you can just pass a JSON object. So for instance, I, I abbreviated Mitch's uh, data here, the taco king. And this, depending on what driver you have, this will send this from your server to your database over the internet, because they might be different computers, they might be the same computer. And it will put it in the database, and the database, if it's one that saves things to disk, which potentially, probably, you want it to be, it'll save this information to its disk, so it is now persistent. You can now find it. So you need to retrieve info on everybody who is a taco king. You can call find one. Well, find one will find only one person who is a taco king. So this is what's called a query. And we're querying for any JSON object that has a property named class that has taco king as its value. So really simply, you can look up any taco king. If this were named Mitch, I could look up information on Mitch and it would give me back whatever JSON object I stored. So if you've worked with databases before, you see it's, it's not that strange. If you haven't worked with them before, hopefully it's not that strange either. We're shoving some JSON in and we're getting it out. Now, another really useful thing you can do with Mongo is edit your JSON objects. So let's say Mitch evolves from a taco king to a taco god. We can send this query to update one, find whoever's name is Mitch, and now set his class to taco god. So this is a very brief introduction to Mongo. I highly encourage you to check out the docs on Mongo. Hopefully I have a URL here. No, maybe not. Google it. You can Google it. But you can check out the docs. There's a complicated API. Well, not complicated, but robust. It has a lot of stuff in it. You can do all kinds of things that you might need to do to make a game. These are the ones we're going to use here, I think, basically. And it's got drivers for many languages. You can use Mongo from C Sharp if you want, or Java or anything. Tonight we're going to be using it from Node and JavaScript. And this is how you very simply get access to the Mongo driver, right? You use our old friend npm install, and you save it in. So, you want to do an example of saving to Mongo? Yep. Okay. I'll do it. Well, this one's going to be a little more complicated, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but we'll stick through it. Okay, so cool. I have my code I wrote before up here. I'm really not changed. Um, the next step here is going to be the very first step is going to be what Josh suggested here. I'm going to kill my server that's running right now. And I'm going to npm install mongodb dash dash save. So this is worth noting. This is not actually installing Mongo. This is installing the node driver for Mongo. I already have Mongo installed on my machine. If you wanted to do that, um, you can go to Mongo's website and download it and install it right now. You'll need to do that too. Um, it's really not uh, my internet working. We're going to post some JSON to server localhost slash player, just like I did in my web browser, like nothing different. A little bit different. I didn't get in my web browser as a post. Um, so then we need a JSON object of some sort. So I'm just going to make a new one. In this particular call, we don't really care too much. Oh, I'll use it first. Using simple JSON. The second thing we're giving you guys in our GitHub is simple JSON. It's a little way to deal with JSON inside Unity easily. So this will require a JSON object. I'll make one. And then my intelligence will die. Okay, and then the last thing is it has a callback. So we've been doing a lot of callbacks in Node.js, and now we get to do one inside of Unity. So if you haven't done one in C Sharp before in Unity, it's very, very similar, actually. It's just um, that very funky thing there, this is an action string, JSON object, blah, blah, blah. 
It just means like it's a function that takes a string and a JSON object. So in this case, you can do it with just saying like, the string here is the error code actually, so we'll call it ERR, and then the JSON object is the result. Um, and I will make that function and just put it right inside here. So now this is the code that gets called when the server responds. So I guess let's start off by seeing if we actually get this code called. So let's do debug.log. Call. Oh, uh, now we'll run. Make sure there are errors. Yeah, there are errors. Yeah. Uh, my giant font size. Uh, I'm missing a fat arrow out there. Yeah, sorry, that goes off the end of the screen. I didn't anticipate how large that font was going to be. So, nothing. There we go, they all went away. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, so, okay, so I'm going to read fat arrows. All right, so cool, if you see on my main camera, I attached that script, that's why there's nothing else in the scene. So if I run now, I should hopefully have a button on my screen. I do, it's gigantic. It says new, you can hit it. And if you see my log, I got called, which means the server at the very least responded. So that's great. Um, so what about displaying that player, like in parsing that data out? That's kind of important. Like I got a player, but I can't see anything about them or extract those properties, it's not very useful. Um, so really quickly, what I'm gonna do here is make a function called like, That's going to take our JSON object, JSON, and it's going to extract all the parameters. I guess we need to make some kind of data structure to hold it. We're in C sharp. You know that's what we do. Make something strong to type. So this is called player data. Uh, and what is it going to have? Well, the same stuff we made in JavaScript. It's going to have a name. It's going to have uh, I gave it, gave it health. Gave it coins, and I gave it actually. I gave it I do care a little bit depending on how I'm going to demo this. Um, so I don't care too much. Um, I think it's the answer. I'll make it that Let's do this. Let's put it here. Let's bring it here. That way it's just all done the same way. Um, okay, so load player D. What's that can do? Well, I have this JSON object here. That's great. And it's basically just a dictionary. So in C sharp, a dictionary is another word for like, um, something that has string keys and properties of any sort. Well, I think it's different the string. In this case, they are string keys. So I have my JSON, and I'm going to grab the property name out of it, and I'm going to assign it. First I'm going to do our player data, new player data, and hopefully I can just assign all this stuff. Really good. And I can't say it's made a public. Uh -huh. One part coding line. Okay, cool. So, What's the name? It's hopefully it's this thing, um, and probably cast to a string. And that all looks pretty happy, so I'm going to copy and do it a few more times uh, for all the other properties. So one thing we do in Scrap 3, Josh, you can talk about it a little bit while I finish copy and pasting a bunch of stuff, is the automatic serial list and stuff. Sure. So Charles is going to copy and paste code. Um, <laughs> Easier to demo that way. While, while he's copying and pasting, one thing that we hate is actually copying and pasting code. So we have another utility. Um, that actually uses C# -sharp reflection to run through. It, it runs through all of the properties that are in this JSON, and when it finds a property, say name, it'll then use reflection to find the member variable inside player data and then set it automatically based on what type it is, so that you don't have to copy and paste the code. But that was getting a little more complicated than we wanted to demo. So just to see clearly how things are working, this is what happens. We have to do this cast because this is just a dictionary mapping strings to objects. So we know behind the scenes it's really a string, so that's why it's safe for us to cast. All right, I'm actually just going to save all this in a, in a variable in the class for the demo. It's going to make my life easier. Um, in general, I probably would have made this one return something, but I think it's quicker if we just move along here. Right, let's hold this member variable called player, and that's going to hold all my data. So anytime I call this function with some JSON, hopefully I have some player data, and that's going to be cool. Um, so I'm going to call that right here with the results of that function that came back. So there's that result object which is currently JSON, and it currently contains all the fun stuff of my player, so I'm just going to load it straight out of there. Um, and then I guess I forgot the ID, so I guess I'm going to load that while we're here. So normally, you would want to check this error, right? So when, you're, when your client gets a response back from the server, it gets an error and this result. So normally, you would check, like, hey, is my error something? If so, let me handle that error. 
if my error is null or empty, then I'm actually going to look at the result and load it. But we're skipping the error handling now. I think all the code we post on GitHub has error handling and stuff, so you guys can actually see it um, and see, like, oh, maybe this is a reasonable way to deal with everything. Um, so I'm going to check now if my player is not equal to null, because I've actually read it in at some point. Remember, we're generating an ongoing function. I'll just kind of GUI up some stuff that looks reasonable. So in this case, GUI.label. Display of all the information that's going to us back inside of Unity in some like, very simple means, right? And it runs, nothing's there yet. New player. Um, mostly all went to the screen fine, except for some invalid source cast exception, which was not expected, but on line 38, so that's useful. Uh, my shell did not come back as an integer. That is true. I forgot about that. Um, so this exact version of the JSON parser we're using a little different than what I'm used to. Uh, so you need to convert your integers. You need to tell it to convert them. So we do system.convert.toInt32, and that's what I will do for all my integers. It would. It probably would. If I was going to do a lot more of them, I think I'd totally agree to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, there we go. Now we have no more invalid cast exceptions. And my font size is incredibly tiny on the screen, so it's really hard to read. Um, so for us, we've been running right. We're not sending shells back. Oh, cool. It's yeah. great. Okay, cool. So that's all good. Um, my server, oh, I can reboot my server afterwards. But, um, so that's all there. Now we have basic display of what we created. Now like, we would want to interact with this object in some way, obviously. It's just got to have a user account that I created and I can see their data. It's not sufficient to have that because I won't have to interact with it, so that's probably the next step. Right. Um, so here we go. Let's go to our Node.js code and make another function really quick that does something with this. Um, so we look here. Yeah, I think we're going to speed this up by copy and paste. Maybe that's a really good idea. It's kind of slow. Um, so all this code is for you guys on GitHub already, so you don't have to memorize it. You can pull it down. So we're going to just copy and paste what we have, um, and then we'll, we'll run through quickly how it works. So most importantly, um, for us here right now demoing, I will highlight the important ones actually. So the first thing we're going to do, I guess, is probably make this byte button. Um, I didn't do anything. Do you want to do something with the demoing, like saving and loading it off the disk? Or? Well, we're sending it's going to. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So we have a fight. We're going to make the fight endpoint. That's probably the first, like, most important one. Like, we want the player to, be able to lose health and to be able to gain some coins. So. Um, this is an abstracted idea. This little utility function right here is actually probably unnecessary in the code. But basically, we call a function called find one on the player's collection, just like we did earlier to insert one. We now can find one. Um, and you'll see what we're passing in here is the player's ID. And that part's important. That's part of what the client's getting back. Um, so, yeah, so it's a, it's a string. What you noticed was the player ID was a string when it comes to us and we send it back. But to look things up in Mongo really fast, you have to use a Mongo object ID. So we call this little function object ID .create from hex string to turn the player ID string into a special Mongo object ID. And then you, you see the first thing is just this query here that we're used to find one wherever the ID matches what player ID we have. 
So now this is a really easy way for us to look up the player when the client sends the ID to the server. So what we're going to do with that here is we're going to find that player based on this ID. I guess we should talk about the Express part of this, because why do we install Express? Like, there's an HTTP server built into Node, and there's other ways to deal with this. But what Express does really well is it says, remember earlier I just registered an endpoint called players? Well, now I've registered like, this more complex endpoint here, if you see the whole highlighted line. It says players, and then there's this like colon player ID thing, and then fight at the end. So the, this part here with the colon can be anything. Like it's, an, it's a parameter to this endpoint. So what that means is the actual URL that the Unity client's gonna be passing is just gonna pass their ID as part of the URL. And then uh, Express will see that and see that it matches the pattern of players something fight, and it'll pass it through this function. And in the process, it'll extract that player ID and stick it in a variable that we can use. So that's the that's the part that gets passed right here. If you see rec dot the player ID, like Express did all that behind the scenes for you because you just decided to put a colon in there, and it's like, oh, okay, I can pattern match that and extract it and give it to you. So that's really cool. It's an easy way to implement REST like APIs, basically. And it doesn't have to be just one variable. You can have like a whole a whole bunch of slash colon variable name slash colon variable name slash colon variable name, and every variable name will get filled in by what the client sends and put in this rec dot params object. So later on, if we want to send like what sword we want to use, that could be slash colon sword name, and then we could extract that with rec.params.sword name. Right, yeah, totally. Um, so again, just like all the stuff we're doing here, this function gets called, we, it's gonna go try to find an object in the database, and we pass it another function to call. So when, when, um, <laughs> when it's done finding the thing in the database, it calls this code, basically, this function here. And you'll see I'm using a fat arrow right now here, which is, is fun. Um, so the error that comes in, um, again, this is mostly being ignored in this code, but you'd want to handle it if you could. Um, so the player data that comes in is actually player data, just like what we stuck in the database, just like what we got out earlier. Um, so we're going to grab that player data, and now you can manipulate it just like it's a JavaScript object here. So we just say, well, is your health greater than zero? Because you're still alive. Um, increment your kills because you killed something. We give you a random number of coins and subtract a random number of health. So, And then what we do is we call another function, which is right up here. Again, a one-line function. It just calls update one. So the parallel to finding something or inserting something, the one other thing you really need to know about Mongo is how to update something that exists. And this is an example of that. So again, we get the ID that's a string, turn it into an object ID, pass in. The only difference about this one is we pass in that player data, and we are updating it full full cloth essentially. Like this is like this player data replaces the old player data completely. In Mongo, there's lots of ways to only modify part of the player data, but we're not really getting into that in this demo. Talks about. Um, so we take this whole player data object we've modified, stick it back in the database, and again, when Mongo is done doing that, it calls our last function here, and we send that whole player object back to the client. But just real quick, like this is the reason that we're going through this entire presentation. So right here is our game, right? What happens <laughs> is when you call fight, we give you a kill, we give you some random number of coins, and then we subtract. This is a minus equals here. We subtract some random number of health. It's not a very fun game. It, it actually does compare to a lot of the top selling games on iOS right now. <laughs> um, but here's our logic, right? So if we notice, hey, people are dying too fast and they're not playing our game anymore, then really quickly on the back end, well, we just change the number of health that you lose. And that happens instantaneously when we push our new code. So we've taken the game logic and moved it to the back end. So again, really hard to cheat, and we can tweak it like right away on the fly. So that's where the power comes from, and that's why we bother with doing all of it. All right, let's see if we can make Unity actually care about that. Um, so we now, have, we have the ability to make a new player in Unity. We want to make one more of these buttons, basically, and this one's just going to let us fight. And this will be really simple. We're mostly going to be copying code we put it written. Um, so in this case, I'm going to move the button over here, and I'm going to call it fight. Um, it's going to look like that. And now if you remember the syntax that we were talking about, how we talk to the server, instead of just talking to the local server slash players, we're going to append in here our player ID, so in order for this to work, in order for this whole button to work, we're going to need a, we're going to need a player object, obviously. Um, dot ID, which we read in earlier, and then we're going to append in the word fight at the end, because you might want players to be able to do more than just fight in your game. So the verb here at the end, fight, is one thing the player can do. Um, and then, again, we're passing in a empty JSON object that's not very important. And we're getting back this data. And since we're doing a really simple example here, the servicing our entire user data back to us every time, um, not what you do in production, but obviously for this example it works, we're going to get back this result, which means we can just parse it the exact same way we got it before and load it straight into our player data, and everything should just update at that point. Um, so I'll save that and see if that can work. 
Um, run. Okay, cool. Now we have two gigantic buttons on my screen. As you can see, the new one creates my new player, and I still didn't restart my server, but that's not going to be useful. So, <laughs> one thing is when you modify your server, you have to run it again. That, that's, if, if there's ways to actually avoid that, but right now I can do that. So, my server's running again, I'll connect again, create a new player. This time my unit does not give me an error, which is great. Um, if you guys can see any of that, the font is terribly small, I apologize. Um, that's my player ID um, and all my stuff. And now when I hit fight, hopefully, cool, my, my health goes down, my coins go up, um, my kills go up, the last number on the bottom is kills. Um, there's like one quick line of code to make all this font bigger, maybe I'll do that really quickly. Do you want to just copy and paste your sample code? Yeah, I think I'll, well, actually, let's just go to the example soon. That seems, oh, okay. that seems well, this object and add the example object. So that should be the simplest way it's all working because I kind of ran into a nice and the server URL is actually primary here. Do you need HTTP? So this is using the code we prepared in advance. Yeah, the, nice the, font's, the font's a little bigger. You can actually read it. So, um, so new, creates your new player data, just like before, except I actually wrote some variables on the screen, which is nice for names. So again, there's my 100 health player. Now you can fight, and you can see you can lose health. This is all the same exact code we just wrote, just slightly visually better. Um, my coins keep going up, my kills keep going down. Eventually, I'm in danger of dying. And so in this version, we actually have one more function, which we pasted in. Did you paste it in the server? I did paste it in the server. Hopefully, I can buy a potion, which costs 50 coins and restore my health to 100. And there you go. Now I'm playing the world's smallest back-end front-end game, <laughs> which is you guys can go home. I'm and having put, a lot of fun, actually. Put I add in this. Whoa, here we go. On the app store. <laughs> and I'll go. Risky. Risky. Whoa. Potion. Oh, I'm out of coins. I'm out of coins. That's not. Okay, anyway, that's cool. So that's the that's demo of how with Mongo running on my computer and Node running on my computer and Unity running on my computer, they're all talking to each other, and I have a server, a database, and a client. Okay, so one, one more step. Josh wants to do. And then you guys are pros. So now we know how to make the game. Now, there's one problem, right? What if you have to turn off your laptop? <laughs> because right now we installed the database and the server on the laptop. And eventually, you know, Charles is going to want to pack up and go home, and then all thousands of your players are going to be sad. Uh, so let's figure out how to deploy this to a public web server. Now, we teased in the beginning that you could do this for free, and we will show you how to do it for free. So. We're going to talk about two websites that help you out with this. The first one is called MongoLab. So MongoLab is MongoDB as a service. It's by some people who are experts on Mongo. I think they actually helped develop Mongo. And what they'll do is, on their own hardware, using their own bandwidth, they will maintain a Mongo database for you. And you'll set it up with them, and then they'll give you back the URL that you should use in your server. So you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. They have 24-7 customer support. Special. Uh, Shout out to Angela and Kevin if you're here. I don't know, at 3 in the morning last night, we were up fixing a problem on our replication server. And they were helping. That was super cool. By the way, don't be an indie developer if you don't like being up at 3 in the morning. <laughs> and especially if you launch a game with like a live service like this. It was kind of crazy. Uh, so the best part about MongoLab is it's totally free up for a database up to 500 megabytes, which is a lot. It's a lot. Now, it's not the absolute fastest, right? Because you're sharing it with a bunch of other people. You're sharing the hardware. But it will let you get up and running. Um, you can prototype, you can develop. You can probably support like up to, I don't know, 10 concurrent users at the same time. Which if you think about concurrent, that means people playing your game at the exact same time. So that's probably like 10,000 users um, that you can support for free. So that's great. So you go to mongolab.com and you can create an account, which I think you've already done. Yeah, we're going to show you that. We're going to skip that stuff. Oh, okay. an so you can create an account and you can say, hey, make me a free database and it'll give you back the URL. So that's how you get your database for free. Now, how do you get your actual server? Well, there's another website called Heroku, which is pretty awesome. There's there's a bunch of competitors for Heroku. We, we like this one, um, just for some reasons when we did some research, but I encourage you guys to investigate. But what's awesome about Heroku is they are a load balancer and a server manager. So they will spin up servers for you. They support all kinds of um, server environments. Node.js is the one that we use, but they support Ruby and Java. I don't think they do C Sharp yet. But you can send them through Git your server, and they will spin it up. You send them your server code, and they'll spin it up on an actual server. And what's nice is it's a load balancer. So you can spin up multiple instances. They call instances dynos. 
and you can really rapidly scale from one dyno to a thousand dynos as your users increase. And they'll use a front end load balancer that as web requests come in, these REST requests come in, it'll farm them out to whichever server isn't busy. Um, lots of times that's just randomly, and then when one backs up, it tells the load balancer, hey, stop sending me requests, and then it'll send them to other people. But it works, it works really well, and it lets you scale really quickly for when you make the next Flappy Bird, and all of a sudden there's a million people clicking your random button. <laughs> so easily scalable. The most important thing is one dyno per app is free. So again, you can do your dev and your prototyping totally for free. And actually, when we're working on Scrapboards, we have a lot of utility server instances, like for administration and some scheduled things when we close our arenas. And we can use free dynos for those too, because they give you one free dyno per app. So you can create a whole bunch of different apps, and you get one free dyno. Uh, the one requirement here is that it has to be idle six hours of every 24 hours. So if you have users using it around the clock, you're going to have to switch from free to what they call a hobby dyno, which is only $7 a month, which by the time you have enough users to require it, you're hopefully making $7 a month. <laughs> the, pro, the pro dynos, which are what we use, are $25 a month. So it's really, it's really pretty reasonable. They also have really great customer support 24-7. We really love them. One cool thing that when you really start to get into this DevOps backend management is you can actually pick what data center your dynos are in. So ideally, you'll pick the same data center that your MongoDB is in so that the latency between your database and your server is really fast. Like we have both of ours in Amazon's Virginia data center. Hopefully that doesn't help you hack our game. <laughs> if it does, actually, I'd be kind of interested. So let me know if you hack our game based on that info. <laughs> Another really cool thing is they have their own REST API for managing their whole server manager and load balancer. So you can write your own tool, which we've actually done, to spin up new apps and to scale up your dynos. So you can have your own system that monitors your load and figures out when it needs to raise dynos or create a new app. Like We have different versions of our app um, based on what's in production and what we're testing and what we're load balancing on. And you can use your own tools to use the REST API to talk to Heroku to do all that stuff. So it's really flexible too. Free and flexible and scalable, really good. Um, we won't show you our Scrap Force admin awesomeness, but if you're curious later, we can show it. Okay, so how to deploy to Heroku? Not that hard, I'm gonna run through the steps and then Charles will run you through getting our cool game live on the internet so that you can access it from anywhere. Oh, if anybody has like a phone, no, no, they need the unity app. Well, you can try to endpoint in your browser. Anyway, what you do, you go to the Heroku website, you create yourself an account, then you get to create your app, and you get to pick your URL. So you can make like igdalaherokuapp.com. Then you create something called a proc file, which basically says, hey, I want you, when you boot a dyno, to run node and whatever your JavaScript file name is. And then you add the engines to your package.json, so we say what version of node we're gonna use, 4.22, so we're using. You have to install this thing called the Heroku tool belt. It's just a quick download. And then you push your code to Heroku via Git, which is really awesome. Hopefully you guys are using Git already for your source control, because if your computer gets nuked, you want all of your code saved somewhere. So if you're on Git already, it's really easy to add Heroku as a remote for your repository, and then you just push your kit code there, and it automatically deploys. It's that easy. And then you change your client URL to talk to this new Heroku URL you created. And there's automatic free SSL there. If you use HTTPS instead of HTTP, so you get automatic free security, which is also really nice. That's why Hunter's so excited. So we're going to live code setting that up. And go. OK, cool. So here we are back. That's my sample code. Let's close that. Here's our actual one we coded tonight. Get some stuff pasted in. Um, so what Josh said, there was like two added. I think my engine's here at the bottom of package.json that's just telling whatever wants to know that I like node, good thing in this version. Um, and then we need a proc file, which I believe needs to include certain text. So need to include, want to it off the top of your head, Josh? I think it's web core in the space node. Yeah, okay. I, have, I have that too, so we'll just open it up. Uh, open recent. Heroku has really good docs too, so you would, you would either learn this stuff by reading the Heroku docs or just copying it from our GitHub. Yeah. Let's open up our demo call simple back end. Yep, nope. like Josh said, web colon node index.js. Really, it's not a complicated file. Um, so let's go back to our <coughs> one. 
question? Yes. Yeah, please. To the subject of employee samples from the units, does that have comments? Yes. Okay. It does, right? Uh, if it doesn't, I'll make sure you have some tonight. We can, yeah. we can do it. Because yeah, like, I'd like to know what this stuff is without having to call you every single time. Yeah, yeah, it totally makes sense. I'll spend some time commenting tonight. All right, thank you. Yeah, that's actually very that's nice. That's a great question. <laughs> New file. Okay, pasting in this thing. Proc file. Save this file. So that's saying, hey, Heroku, when you get a web request, <coughs> call node with index.js. And you can actually set up proc files with other things in them because Heroku can spin up servers that do things other than handle web requests. Like we use one to close our arenas whenever they're done, so it runs through everybody who played our arena and gives them an award. All right, so there's my proc file, there's my package JSON, and the next step, I think all my code's good here, I think the next thing I have to do is go to Heroku's website. So I'm already logged in there. This is my dashboard for my account. You see some of our servers, you see the RAM server from here. You see this plus right here, create new app. It's probably never been easier to make a server in the history of the world. Um, so now I need to see a name. Josh told me IGBA LA. It's a good name. Oh. Only lowercase. Only lowercase. Well, that's what it's going to be. IGBA lowercase. And there we go. We'll spin that up. Heroku will make me a server, which is all virtualized. Obviously, they're not bringing a physical machine off the rack for me, but <laughs> still good enough. Um, and then there's a lot of ways to deploy here. Like Josh suggested, we can just use the tool belt, or you can actually just hook it up to your GitHub account, and every time you check into GitHub, it'll automatically deploy. That's what we use in development a lot, actually. Um, so for this demo, though, I will probably just init git in the directory kind of following these instructions. So Yeah, it's really nice to tell you exactly what to do. The reason we're not using the GitHub um, auto one tonight is because you probably want your own personal server code to be private, maybe. In GitHub, you have to pay like $7 a month, I think, to have private code hosted there. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to splurge on that, it's really nice that whenever you push to GitHub, it automatically updates your server. Otherwise, it's like one extra set. It's not too big a deal. Cool. And then I'm going to add Heroku to the remote. That's that next step they told you. So in Git, um, if you guys have any familiarity with it, like the, you can have multiple remotes, and you have your local branch of the code, essentially, and then you have multiple remotes, and you can push to any of them. In this case, the way you deploy to Heroku is, is pushing to a remote, so you might push to GitHub.com, essentially. Um, so there we go. It added a remote for Heroku, which is great. And then, of course, I've never actually checked any of this code we wrote tonight in Git, so I'm just going to add all of it, I hope. That makes sense. That's what they tell me to do. And then I'll commit it all. And this is a great message, so I'll just copy it. Cool. It actually checked in a bunch of stuff I probably would have chosen to check in, but hopefully that's OK. And then we we're going to push it. So we have all of our Git code here, ready to go. Oh, I guess. Yeah, it's all good. Copy. Other question? Yes. Yeah. Why is it called Git, not Get or something else? You gotta, you gotta call Linus and ask him. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And he'll probably swear at you, so be careful. <laughs> not the nicest guess. Thanks for wrong. Um, cool. So what it's doing now is, if you see my command line here scrolling, scrolling by really fast, it's pushed the code to Git. That's really fast because it's just a bunch of JavaScript files. Um, but now Node, or sorry, Heroku is taking my project and compiling it into what they call a slug and building it so it's ready just to spin up whenever they need to as a, essentially a container format um, that can be run in the cloud. So there we go. My Heroku has my code now. Um, we can confirm that by going on Heroku and hitting the activity button, hopefully. And sure enough, I deployed code to Heroku, which is cool. Um, if I uh, go now to open a new browser window. So we named it IGDA LA, and it's going to be at Heroku app. Dot com, that's where your default domain is. And remember we made hello earlier, let's see if that works. It says hello. So now I have hello in the cloud, that's great. So Josh alluded to the next step, which is, well, the other part of our app, probably using Mongo doesn't work yet, because Heroku doesn't have a Mongo install on it by default. So we can go to this place called Mongo Lab, and Josh said, hey, I can create a database here. Here's some Scrapforce databases. Um, let's create a new database in the cloud. OK, cool. So you get to choose your cloud provider here. We're just going to use AWS because um, it's simple. Choose single node, sandbox, and don't accidentally pick the $420 per month plan. <laughs> They'll ask you for your credit card, don't worry. It's fine. Um, so I get to pick a database name. Hopefully, IGDLA is not taken here. I don't yep. think it matters because they don't be unique. Yeah. OK, created. Cool. Now I'm creating a database in the cloud. Also stupidly easy. Um, so now I have a database in the cloud. And hopefully I can find it in my list. Great, it's right here. I'm gonna click on it. The one other step after you make a database is you need to have some way to log into it. They don't let anyone log into it and use it. 
So if you hit the users button here, sometimes this loads. Yeah. Ah, click here to create a new one. Wow, they could not make this easier. Um, so I'm going to create a new database user who I'm just going to call DB user. And if your password can be really boring that you guys are all going to see on the screen in a second anyway. Go create, uh, enter. Oh, that all worked. Great. And now I need a connection string. That's the that's the part here that's important. So up here they give it to you, right up here, and you can copy it. You'll see it's missing the two components I just made, but I'll paste them in. Um, and now one thing I did um, that I didn't do during the demo here, but I I made the app we're using first check an environment variable for the DB URL, um, and then use that hard-coded local host thing we did earlier. So in Heroku, you can actually set your environment variables, and this is like the last step of hooking everything together. Um, if you go to settings, reveal config vars, you can make as many environment variables as you want. I made one called DB URL, and now I'm going to paste in our database URL. So in general, it's good practice to keep the stuff in config variables instead of putting it in your code, um, because you're pushing your code to GitHub. It's really easy, easy to accidentally push it to a public GitHub repository. There are websites you can go to online that automatically scrape GitHub for other people's credentials, and you can just find tons of credentials out there if you're so inclined. So if you keep your credentials and stuff in a config bar, there's a much smaller chance of accidentally leaking them. Because you need to log into this website first to get them and see them, and even press another button to reveal them. So, um, so there you go. I've set up my my um, my server now to use that. Do um, you think I have to restart it? I probably do. Um, IDDLA. So this is the Heroku toolbar right here, just a quick demo. I just told it to restart my server and it did. Um, so now that's cool. So now my, that means that in theory, um, if I hit up this website at players, this part will work too. So it'll create a new player in the database and send it back to me. And it did. And now just to confirm that all like full circle came together, you can actually use Mongo's web interface to browse your collections in your database. Um, and hopefully that part works with the demo here because that's a really cool part. Yeah. And also to prove this is working, you guys from your phones can all hit igdala.herocoapp.com now. Yeah. yeah, slash players, and it'll just create a player for you and show you the result at the very least. So now you see this collection down here, which is what we said, like it's a table of data in Heroku and Mongo. It has one document in it. If I click it, you can actually view it. There you go. That's my user. It's pretty, pretty tiny. Cool. <laughs> it's pretty tiny. Let me get a little bigger. There we go. Well, still pretty tiny, but it's there now. So that's the cool part, except that Unity hasn't talked to that yet. And to fully complete this, um, I exposed my server URL in my little script here earlier, so I'm going to change this to HTTP slash slash. You get S, so it's secure. Oh, well, yeah, why not? Um, I G D A L A dot Heroku app dot com. So there's no messing with like SSL certificates or worrying about that. Right, Heroku does really. worry about that for you. So now if I run my Unity app, we'll be talking to the cloud. I hit new. You can tell us something about it took a while. Um, and you can hit fight, um, and there you go. Now we're talking to the cloud, and just to once again show that all worked, we are going to go to our database, look at our list of players, and we should have two players now, the one I created in the web browser and the one I created in Unity. Whoop, yeah, everybody else in here. A bunch of them apparently. I might have hit new or something a bunch. I was very impatient. Um, but anyway, there you go. Basically, that's the demo, and we'll have all the code online. So you can see all your players playing, Ship it. Uh, I think last slide is this. So if you do have any questions, we're going to take questions now. Um, if you have any questions later, feel free to write us. So Charles is Charles and Jacob's guy. I'm Josh. And then here's this awesome link to the most awesome game ever. Uh, so when you get the PowerPoint, you can click that and, and play some Scrap for us. And you'll know what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, so any questions on what you saw? Yep. Did you just invalidate my college education with this two-hour presentation? No, he extended it. <laughs> okay. I didn't let this in college either, so it's okay. Okay. <laughs> yep. Great job, guys. I, I think uh, live coding under pressure like that is pretty impressive. <laughs> Very cool. Um, when you guys were sort of looking at server-side solutions, did you look at any, like, paid products, like GameSparks or anything like that? Like, what drew you to this particular? So we actually started this like three years ago, pretty much a long time ago, um, doing this research. And um, backends as a service, back game backend as a service wasn't really around yet. We kind of uh, joked that maybe we should start that up. But while we were working on this, lots of those sprung up. Um, we've looked at them, and if you're starting a game from scratch, they're kind of interesting. 
I mean, there's a couple drawbacks other than they're, what we saw, they're not as easy to like modify and tweak as, as just writing it yourself. And writing it yourself just turns out to be not that hard once you have like a starting base. Um, they do offer a lot of stuff really quickly, but once you start to veer away from like the very standard way games work, then you start to lose it, that. It might be highly dependent on your engineering budget for your project. Mm -hmm. like, that question, really. like, if you can afford an engineer who's doing your back end stuff, then doing it yourself might make the most sense. If not, you figure out somewhere to make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of, I have a little bit of like not invented here syndrome myself, which Charles always yells at me about. So I'm kind of biased, but they, I mean, they do offer a lot of good things. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, one was, you have files called package.json. Yeah. Is that something you created, or does it get created? OK, so package.json is, is a node standard. So that's what uh, node projects in general will all have one. Um, when I started the demo, I typed npm init, um, and that created the, the, the empty one for me with a couple things filled in. Okay. And during the demo, I added a few things to it. And that whole package.json will be able to get up so you can reference it. One thing that's in that file that's just like a mess, if you looked at it, it looked really big by the end. I actually have, we use, um, we use something called ESLint, which is a JavaScript linter, which basically detects really dumb things you might be doing in JavaScript accidentally and warns you about them. Um, so there's like a bunch of params in there for like what ESLint options we like. But that's why it looks maybe bigger than it needed to be. Yeah, the most important thing package.json does is it lists all of the NPM packages and the versions you need to actually run your game. Because typically, you would not actually check your node modules folder into Git. Usually, you only check your own code, not other people's code. And then when you deploy on Heroku, or any system like this, they automatically pull down all the packages that are referenced in your package.json. And that way you don't have all this other people's code hanging out in your Git that, th in theory, you shouldn't be modifying anyway. The other one was, um, you mentioned that you guys use reflection. Uh, does that only work if the version <coughs> names are the same? Yeah, so we, the way we set up is our data classes, our models essentially that we use in C-sharp have the same names as the stuff stored in the database um, for that kind of reflection. Which actually gets a little annoying because the standard in C sharp is for your public properties that have capital names, and your standard in JavaScript is for your um, member your properties that have lowercase names. So we went with capital names in JavaScript, but unfortunately nobody's figured out a, a good standard for both of them. <laughs> Other questions? So the second one. Do you guys um, have any experience with like region balancing? You know, you've got a server in the United States, but you've got a lot of players coming from Europe. I, I wish we had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't. So, I mean, we've had to scale our dinos up to like six dinos, but all in Virginia, and that, that took care of it. We haven't had that issue. So, part of, part of it has to do with Scott Forth. You didn't get to see the game, actually, but it's a, it's a turn based strategy game. So, like, our REST calls that we're making are not critical real time things in terms of like the user's wait time, because it's a half of a second, like going through the middle of seconds. Like, they not received. It'd be different if your game had more real time requirements. But Heroku does let you pick whatever like AWS region, or I think they also use Google and Azure too. So you can pick like, hey, have some dinos in Europe or have some dinos in Japan if you want to do that. But just as a follow up, wherever if you have your Mongo in uh, Virginia and your your dino is over in Europe, that you have round trips from you know between those two things, that actually they actually charge you for that. Yeah. For regions. I think typically if you did that, you just shard your whole game, probably, and you have a Mongo in Europe too. Yeah. So that'd be that'd be like if you needed that, you would probably split things up. You would probably not want to go to worldwide services. Scrap Force is still worldwide server. We have probably no problem. So. Hopefully, we will. Yeah. <laughs> you guys do any tests for scaling before you release? Yeah, like yeah. So we did. We wrote some on. scripts. So we wrote a little script that captured all our raster calls um, and saved them all as JSON objects, and then we wrote some Node.js code that then could read those JSON objects and make those calls. And then we had a couple clients spin up and simulate like 10,000 users concurrently. And it worked OK. I mean, we had to scale up. But yeah, definitely. It's, it's a bit of a bit of error, but it was like, what, a day or two to get everything working. Not too bad. But yeah, it's nice. You can just gives you kind of peace of mind knowing that there's literally a slider in Heroku that you can just slide up. And you know, well, worst comes to worst, we'll just spend a few more dollars in a month. But hopefully we'll we'll be making revenue off that, so it's worth it. All right. Oh no. What? One, one last question. <coughs> um, yeah. Do you do you find? Uh, remember at the beginning you said, "Hey, this is your game," and it was like those six lines of JavaScript. 
Um, do you find a lot of issues with your bigger games where you have code written on the client and on the server and they're not in the same language? Yes. Yes, we do. So we lots lots of times we end up having to write the same thing on the client and the server to um, cut down on bandwidth use because we don't want too much logic. Um, well, because we don't want to be sending too much data back and forth. And it's funny because Charles is always like, we'll put it all on the server. And I'm like, no, bandwidth, it's going to be a problem. So it's, it's a tough balance there. Um, but yeah, sometimes we do have to write things and sometimes there's a bug. But what we're going to more and more is just put everything on the server you can because then you can fix it right away. Because you'll be surprised at the bugs you find when you have thousands and thousands of real users. And it's really nice to be able to fix those in under seven to nine days that it takes to get a new client out. Oh, any plans to take Scrap Force to Android? Uh, yes, yeah, we definitely want to. I mean, to get to get really geeky, we're a little more worried about hacking on Android than on iOS, because on iOS you have to jailbreak your phone to hack it, and on Android you you don't. You just sideload it and you get a little warning. So there are some things that the client still does. I, I don't want to go too much into detail because you guys are all engineers, so you'll be the first ones to hack it. But yeah, so we got to solve some problems before we go to Android. But definitely, we want to serve the Android community. All right. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, Martinez. Thank you have our emails. If any of you love mobile games or whatever, uh, we're looking for a full-time QA tester. It's not the most uh, exciting job, except you do get to play Scrap Force all the time. So please uh, send a resume if you're interested in uh, working on Scrap Force. Once you go home and play it, you send it.